So let's now go to Dr. Kate Kearney from University of Washington, who's going to discuss the um, high bleeding risk patients and optimizing DAPT in these complex patients. Dr. Kearney. Thanks so much for that platform. Um, so as described, I'm gonna discuss high bleeding risk patients as well as kind of a complex coronary subset. Here are my disclosures, although none are particularly relevant to this topic. Um, and per perhaps the biggest one is that I'm with two world experts <clears throat> and I'm really gonna give you a layperson perspective of how we interpret this on the clinical side of cardiology, I think from my purview. So the simple question is, is does DAPT help my patient right now? And so first, I think to emphasize that we're obviously making an upfront decision at the time of PCI, but that this is often something that's reevaluated in clinical context and follow-up. Um, and one of the issues is maybe laying out that plan in patient education because they may be seeing a different cardiologist or not really under our purview anymore uh, when transferred in. There are a few cases where there's a simpler answer, at least, in patients that are on oral anticoagulation. We're not really identifying any benefit in terms of aspirin therapy. Uh, and I think that's something that we're going to extrapolate further. Whereas on the flip side, patients with a personal history of stent thrombosis were clearly committed to DAPT, you know, really as long as they can tolerate that and, and as, as possible. Now, in the rest, uh, the devil's in the details and it gets a lot more complicated. It depends on that time frame that we're thinking, but typically picking an initial benchmark and a target in terms of their DAP time period and reevaluating it then. So fortunately, while we're doing all of that, you know, these two fine people and several others have designed a lot of trials to help us better understand how to make that decision making, you know, now that the stents are better and we're getting better results, but overlying that with bleeding risk and long-term ischemic risk um, from the benefits of P2Y12 inhibitor therapy. So in the context of a number of trials that we're reevaluating this as of late, the guidelines for the European guidelines in 2017 and the U.S. guidelines in 2016 focused just on DAPT recommendations, did highlight these differences, mostly in separating patients out on the basis of stable coronary artery disease, of course, versus acute coronary syndrome. In ACS, we believe that DAPT is still tends to be uh, have more benefit in that year. And so that benchmark time period stayed at 12 months. But marching that back to six months in patients in the stable coronary artery disease category seems to be appropriate based off the data with our current evolution, uh, current generation drug loading stents. And then furthermore, if we're balancing that and actually you know, paying attention more to high bleeding risk patients that are showing up more and more um, to our cath lab for potential intervention and overlaying that, that we're starting to march down that shorter benchmark time in the stable patients and that even in ACS considering a shorter duration of six months. And so I think that's just important context looking at the trials uh, that were ongoing at that time that have sort of further elucidated this information. I think there's a couple of themes because there's lots of different drug regimens that were used. Um, and so for me, it's helpful to think about a few key points that overlap with them. So I think one very pertinent one is what does aspirin actually contribute to DAPT? Um, you know, I think that this was something that clearly historically we have done. But in particular, um, in the twilight trial, as mentioned, and a few other different drug regimens as well, we found that aspirin likely increases bleeding without a clear benefit in terms of addition of reduction of ischemic events while the person's on the P2Y12 inhibitor. So importantly, in the twilight trial, these were randomized patients after three months after following PCI. So they had been on DAPT for a period of time. They were felt to be at high risk for bleeding or ischemic events. And so this is in general a higher risk population that in all comers in stent trials for FDA approval, clearly these are healthier patients that are going to be lower risk. And at that point, randomized to continuing to Kegelor with aspirin versus placebo alone. And I think, you know, it's really important to highlight that we didn't see any benefit in terms of reduction in MI or MACE events, which were exactly the same between the groups, but there was a very clinically relevant reduction in bleeding from 7.1 to 4%. And so I think taking that, you know, there is still a short DAPT period applied here, but in general, if we're looking at patients and getting them to that 12 month mark benchmark, and likely even before that, I think in clinical contexts where we've applied this in other um, and other facets that perhaps the P2Y12 inhibitor is really what's carrying the weight there and that the addition of aspirin may be less relevant. So particularly in patients that are higher risk, I think that's something to consider uh, and is, is a theme in, in several of the trials that are going. Now, I think the second question that we're really giving a lot more attention to is how to define if our patients are at high bleeding risk. Of course, there's folks who are frail, you're seeing in the hospital that that's a concern, but giving uh, a better definition for that has importantly been a focus as of late 
for the ARC definition. If we're looking at the trials, the most common features that have come up are that our age greater than 75 years of age, um, oral anticoagulation, obviously a lot of overlap with the AFib population and indications there, as well as renal disease happen to be the most common. But in general, we're looking for major criteria that place a patient at over a 4% risk of bleeding at that first year or two minor criteria that would put them in a higher risk category. And of course, there's a number of other things that we run into in the hospital or patients referred to us who unfortunately have kind of competing risks here for bleeding and ischemic events. Um, and so, you know, thinking about them in the lens of what can, how much DAPT can I get them through? Um, and is that going to be enough to keep them safe after the procedure? And so focusing more on these high bleeding risk populations, um, one very important trial here is Onyx-1, which looked at patients who importantly all received one month of DAPT followed by a single antiplatelet regimen up to a year. This was focused on really a pretty broad population of high bleeding risk individuals and also included ACS, which I think is really important. The patients, um, the comparison groups that they were randomized to for azorolimus saluting stent versus a polymer-free drug-coated stent really aren't as pertinent to this discussion. It was a non-inferiority trial, but if we're looking at the event rates, I think it's important to note that MACE was 17% at one year. So this is a higher risk population than what we've seen in a lot of the earlier stent trials looking for approval. And despite these high rates, you know, actually stent thrombosis, kind of the most feared complication, which clearly has a high mortality rate, was 1.5% in the drug looting stent arm at a year. So taking all of this together, I think uh, we can overlay that with very high bleeding risk patients in terms of that lens. Also of note, though, not all of the patients dropped down to aspirin alone, and just under 40% actually continued on the P2I12 inhibitor uh, alone, and the remaining patients were largely still on DAPT despite the recommendation uh, to stop one agent. So I think overall, that gives us important information in terms of kind of weighing these risks. Um, but of course, there's a number of cases where folks are going to think, well, this case was particularly complicated. You know, we as interventionalists invest a lot into the patient for the procedure and really are focused on that result. Um, and so we may be you know, more committed to reducing ischemic events or feel that there's certain aspects of our patient population that overlay with that in terms of a benefit to DAPT. I think here's one example of a patient who was presenting with escalating angina, was found to have this lesion involving a bifurcation that's calcified, um, unfortunately had some difficulty dissected trying to wire the diag. Things escalated, um, were unable to deliver the gear as, as had been anticipated. And so after minimal predilation landed at 2.75 stent here. And while it is open, I think you can see there's an area here that's underexpanded. The diag was lost. And unfortunately, in this particular patient, he had stent thrombosis the following morning, um, was transferred to our institution in shock and later died. So I think these are really the cases that we're thinking about. And I bring it up in part to highlight that it's not only just the nature of the anatomy that we're identifying here, but also the stent result that we're able to get. And I think the procedural plan um, and some, some important details here about image-guided PCI and other factors that give us feedback that I think are important but are never going to be fully available to us in trials. That being said, this has been looked at um, in several subsets from important trials recently. So in the twilight population, a uh, common theme across the studies is defining complex substrates as three vessels that are treated, three lesions, or three stents. Long, long stented segments greater than 60 millimeters in this case, bifurcation stenting with a two stent strategy or left main PCI, CTO or vein graft interventions or requiring use of atherectomy. Importantly, at least in this sub-study, we did still see a reduction in bleeding events. Um, so figuring some of these risk factors may be collinear, but they are seeing a reduction there without an important or clear in improvement in reduction of ischemic events. Um, and I think this was pretty similar as we saw in Onyx-1, we included the single arm uh, registry data here. And if we're looking across the board, we do see some changes in event rates in terms of complex versus non-complex patients for target lesion failure and MI in particular, but pretty low rates of stent thrombosis. And then once they adjusted for other clinical factors, we didn't see any real significant difference there. So at least in these sub-studies that may be underpowered, we're not seeing any clear distinction here. Um, but there, this is an older uh, uh, pooled analysis looking at six studies that were comparing shorter DAPT duration of three to six months versus at least 12 months of DAPT. 
in patients and comparing complex here in the blue lines versus less complex PCI based off these very similar definitions as the Twilight study used. And we do see that in the complex population, those curves separate, and there was a very significant risk reduction in the complex group using longer DAPT as compared to short DAPT, including the coronary thrombotic events, um, whereas the bleeding you know, separation of the curves is relatively similar. And so I think what they sort of take away from this is at least in a pooled analysis that as we're increasing in PCI complex complexity factors, that probably does favor at least a year of DAPT in those patients that are higher risk for ischemic events um, as compared to a three to six month strategy. And so while well, I think it's not perfectly clear, it's something that we can factor in while, wearing, while weighing all these risks. Now in the DAPT study, if we're looking at 12 months and beyond, complexity is suggested that it doesn't matter as much at this point. Maybe patients have self-selected out and have already presented if they're going to have one of these types of events, and we didn't see a significant interaction there um, in, in that patient population. So I think while all of this is highly complex, we fortunately have smart people who have made some smart tools for us. So there's some scores, including the precise DAPT score that we can use at the time of PCI or the DAPT score that we can use when evaluating the patient at 12 months, looking forward more for a secondary prevention arm. I think importantly, these factor in their bleeding risk, fact, uh, their bleeding risk score factors as well as their ischemic risks to give us better guidance there and are an important tool um, that have been validated in other cohorts as well. And so, you know, I think similar to the two by two table that we've seen in lots of different ways, if we're thinking about patient complexity versus stable versus acute coronary syndrome spectrum, as well as complexity of the case in other facets, and thinking about that on the alternative spectrum of their bleeding risk and trying to find a general range that they fall in and then tailoring that to the patient. And that can be aided at different time points in their evaluation by DAP scores as well. And so I think from the outset, you know, it seems like we can't make up our mind about the appropriate DAPT and we're running back and forth, but this is actually an opportunity to give us more precise recommendations for our patients. And so I think while evaluating their bleeding risk for their short-term planning and defining a benchmark to you know, have a goal DAPT period and then reevaluating their risk, um, bleeding tolerance and, and issues that are happening at that time point make a, uh, make a lot of sense to me. And then finally, I think if there's any patients that were concerned about dropping aspirin while continuing on a P2I12 inhibitor as a single agent strategy is also a good alternative. Um, so with that, I will stop so we can get other comments from these two. Thank you, Dr. Kearney, um, but I would not call you a lay person <laughs> the best interpretation the world of DAP trials by for sure. any, <laughs> any um, expert in the field as you are 